Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And good morning to everybody uh, online. Uh, it is a very, it's a privilege to be here uh, today, uh, a real honor to see uh, old friends and new friends. And I just want to uh, really thank uh, Dr. Balbus, Dr. Perry, and all the organizers for putting on this timely and vital session. It's a huge lift to those of us who put on conferences know so well. So the staff outside, really kudos to you and much thanks for all of your hard work in putting this together. Uh, I would also like to, on behalf of CUGH, really thank all of the public servants. As somebody, as Dr. Newman said, um, I served for almost 18 years as a member of parliament. And one of the enduring things that we know who were elected is our deep and profound respect and gratitude for all of the public servants who work tirelessly, as Dr. Birnbaum is one of them, as is Dr. Uh, Balbus, across this country and around the world to keep us safe. So I want to really thank um, uh, members of NIH, the Centers for Disease Control, the State Department, USAID, the Environmental Protection Agency, FDA, NOAA, USAID, and the millions of public servants who keep us safe. If you want to read a wonderful short book, which is a lovely tome honoring public servants, please look at Michael Lewis's Fifth Risk. Who's checked that out? Anybody? Well, please look at it. It is a really, for those of you who are public servants in these times, read it. If you're a member of the public, read it. It tells, it's an indication of the humble, dedicated work public servants do here and around the world. So thank you for what you're doing. So what I'd like to do is, as Dr. Newman to take his leads. If, if I'm following Dr. Newman, I'm personally really happy. So what I'd like to do is plant some seeds uh, and some trees, as he has recommended. So what I thought I would do is just really, um, in the time that we have together today, is to really share some of the things that we're doing at CUGH, look at some of the opportunities and what we can do to be able to address the environmental stressors that we have make the connection between environmental stressors and human health. And we're going to talk primarily on infectious diseases. And for those of you who are online, we are well aware of the impact of non-communicable diseases on the environment and or vice versa. Um, but that's not the purpose of this particular workshop. But I'm sure it will be one in the near future. Uh, and look at actually some things that, that we can do together to be able to make those linkages. Uh, and what we can do to address them. And it's a real opportunity that has to date, I believe, been uh, neglected and underappreciated in many ways. And we'll get to that in a minute. So here's our web of life, our big challenge, of course, our existential challenge is how do we deal with a planet that's crying out 911 as we are destroying the ecosystem services that keep us and all species alive on this planet? And what can we do to be able to address that? Because we are in, of course, the Anthropocene, and we are responsible for this largely, but we also have the power in our hands to fix it. So as Dr. Newman said, we have three wonderful communities. And um, one of the challenges, of course, is that so many are rightfully invested in the areas of environmental health, one health, and planetary health. And one of the things that we try to do at CUGH is we're a bit of a, we can play a, the neutral actor. And so what we did to the wonderful people working in these three areas is we're not interested in, in semantics, but let, we tied a big ribbon around everybody and said, everyone is welcome. And in fact, that is what we have done at CUGH. So we have been able to attract a wonderful collection of scientists from around the world and across the 171 academic institutional members that we have in our consortium, the largest in the world, in, an, in the interdisciplinary way that we need to be able to address the health challenges and environmental challenges that we've heard so far and that we will continue to hear. So global health is really in a, in a changed definition, and we embedded in a new mission statement for us. We changed our mission statement. And now it, it basically states that we work to improve the well-being of people and the planet across research, education, and service paying homage to that intersection that we know we have to deal with across both biomedical and importantly, non-biomedical disciplines. Because those of us and most of us here are in the biomedical field. We also know that that 
that yin to our yang are the non-biomedical disciplines that we need together to be able to address these challenges. And that's what we're doing at CUGH. So here's looking at some of the environmental threats that we have and, and that impact uh, infectious diseases, climate change, pollution, 9 million deaths a year, yet is largely ignored in global health, the largest killer of people, water and sanitation, uh, food contamination and food insecurity, environmental degradation, as I mentioned before. Something ignored and an opportunity we'll talk about are biodiversity losses. We are in a sixth extinction, tearing apart the web of life with a profound impact upon our lives and the lives of species around the world. Disasters, both natural and anthropogenic. And lastly, but perhaps most importantly, the issue of governance, politics, and weak public institutions. This is a challenge, of course, and also an opportunity. And it's interesting, if you look at the UNDP uh, index of development, and you look at the countries with the worst health outcomes, what glares out at you, at least to me, is that what they have in common, of course, is the weakness of their public institutions. And those countries, we know, that have strong public institutions are able to go and deliver the public goods that we need to be able to improve our lives. So this is an, ignore, an ignored area in global health. And I'll, get to, I'll show you an interesting triangle of needs taken, modified from Dr. Verkow, that will actually show this graphically. So let's look at a few opportunities that, that we have. The first is the linking environmental health to infectious diseases, NCDs, NCDs and the sustainable development goals, as Dr. Newman said. I'll just say this about NCDs. Despite being responsible for 70% of deaths around the world, it receives only 2% of health funding in official development assistance. 2%. We don't want to take money away from infectious diseases, but we definitely need to change this dynamic in terms of the monies we're investing in NCDs. But we also, what's interesting about uh, the environment is we also know that green space and en environmental conditions, ecosystem services, can have a profound impact upon both infectious diseases and NCDs. Our colleagues at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and for those of you who saw the World Health Assembly proceedings last year, there's been an, an increased investment, awareness, knowledge about the interplay between, uh, uh, between green space, ecosystem services, and human health. And I think it's interesting that the WHO uh, and IUCN are actually moving forward in this direction, as are other large organizations. Of course, uh, pandemics, uh, we saw very clearly environmental changes and the changes that are taking place with regard to in, in the environment, people coming closer to ecosystems that have being largely undisturbed, increasing the chances of spillover and the uh, effect of zoonoses. Antimicrobial resistance, we'll hear a little bit more about that later on. 80% of antibiotics are used where? In animal husbandry, in how we take care of, of the animals we eat. Unless we start to modify and change our use of antibiotics in our food systems, we're not going to be able to adequately address AMR, which is a hidden but, but extraordinary threat, as we all know, to our, our lives. Uh, and finally, uh, pollution, 9 million deaths a year. The Lancet Commission, uh, co-chaired by Dr. Phil Landrigan at Boston College, came out with a fantastic report last year. A 2.0 report will be, is being worked on now. And that Lancet Commission is a very important vehicle, I think, for us to be able to draw attention to this neglected challenge. Opportunity number two, connecting One Health and environmental health and degradation to health and security outcomes. Who has power at the cabinet table? The Defense Department. We need to frame the way in which we look at the challenges we see in terms of a, as a security challenge. If we do that, my colleagues, then what we will be able to do is draw increased attention to both from the public as well as policymakers. Because there's one thing policymakers don't want to do is to be on the wrong side of a security challenge. 
because they're politically very vulnerable when it comes to bear that they fail to act in the face of a known security challenge. So I think for us, if we're going to be able to attract attention both from policymakers as well as the public, we can frame our arguments perhaps a little bit differently. In, on your top left, of course, is the degradation of the RLC. It's not unique. But it does show, I think, something that is largely neglected, and that is the issue of water security, access to potable water, which is not only going to have an effect on, on, on uh, our susceptibility to infectious diseases, but also, of course, on the movement of people. You can't live where there isn't potable water. So people are going to move, they're going to shift, they're going to change, and they're going to come together. But they're going to come together and also exhaust the water supplies there. So we have to use our minds, and I think, invest in more research, identify ways in which we can actually use our potable water sources more intelligently. The pollution I mentioned before, that it'll be. We also know the collapse of pollinators and food security. We, this is a neglected area, but it's not only bees, but also birds. The collapse in pollinators is going to have a, a dramatic effect on our food security. And unless we deal with this, we're going to have a significant challenge. The deforestation issues are bringing populations closer to undisturbed environments, increasing the risk of spillover. And then in the middle, of course, is the ocean. As climate change is frying our oceans, acidification is taking place, we're seeing a number of interesting things. Number one, not only are fish populations are collapsing, but they're also decreasing not only in number, but also in size. So the biomass of fish that more than one, I think 1.7 billion people around the world rely on as their primary source of protein is actually nosediving. We're not even thinking about this, and what will it do to populations, for nutrition, to susceptibility to infectious diseases, to movements of people as they leave areas where they cannot actually have access to the food that keeps them alive. And of course, on the bottom are inclement weather and extreme weather conditions due to climate change. More to that later. All right, on climate change. We saw a number of outstanding reports that we all know about. And we have to frame climate change as a security threat. And let me share something very interesting. We were trying to figure out who has, who has been linking climate change as a security threat here in the United States. And it's been the Defense Department. A Senate Foreign Relations Committee asked a few years ago the Defense Department, can you tell us the impact of climate change as a security threat to the US. Bottom line in that report, and it is available, is that the Defense Department, leading Defense Department generals came up and said, clearly, climate change is an existential security threat to the United States, period. End of story. That's the Defense Department. We need to use existing reports like that when our colleagues in defense have clearly raising the red flag and saying, look, Climate change is a threat to the United States. We need to support their work, use their work, and share their work with the public as well as with policymakers. Biodiversity and spillover hotspots. The, as I mentioned before, people are, are moving forward into areas that have largely been undisturbed, which increases our risk for, uh, uh, for spillover and zoonoses. We know that more than between 60 and 80% of new infectious diseases are, going, are zoonotic. That's uh, Dr. Fauci uh, at, uh, has clearly stated that multiple times. Um, but the IUCN has identified 35 biodiversity hotspots uh, where it's a made, there are major reservoirs of species that are under threat with three significant spillover areas, Brazil, DRC, and Southeast Asia. And what we can do, and here's an opportunity for us to look at ways in which we can mainstream conservation into development initiatives that actually reduce the risk of spillover, that enable us to protect biodiverse areas and reduce the chance of us being able to uh, be exposed to uh, zoonoses. The strength in the global health security agenda. 
One of the things we at CUGH are very interested in supporting. And here's some opportunities. The joint external evaluations that all of us know about really have done a very, very good job of showing the strengths and weaknesses across countries in terms of the GHSA. And really, they, a few of those areas are infrastructure, human resources, access to diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. Those are three significant areas. And we have an opportunity to mobilize across academia, government, the private sector, and NGOs to work with countries who are interested in actually strengthening this platform to be able to, to achieve what the, their aspirations are. But colleagues, the interesting thing about the GHSA is, what is it really? It is a public health platform. It's a public health platform that can not only prevent, detect, and respond to potential pandemics, but being a public health platform, it's also a powerful agent for reducing non-communicable diseases. I don't think we make that connection well enough, but by investing in the GHSA, we're also investing in, in a public health platform that can address the leading killer cause of mortality and morbidity around the world, which are NCDs. So it's a dual, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a, a triple benefit because you're also able to address the, the, the social determinants of health. The sixth opportunity is the aggregation and sharing of knowledge. Uh, at CUGH, we have a, um, a website, and one of our subcommittees do just that, attract uh, uh, information, knowledge, training programs, case studies, and others. And we, we actually um, um, share that online. But what we'd like to do a better job of with you is to be able to aggregate more of this knowledge, take best practices, good practices, and share it not only with policymakers, but also with the public. And importantly, communicate it in a way that also, that not only affects people's minds, but more importantly, their hearts. I think one of our challenges as scientists is how are we going to be able to communicate sometimes the dense work we do and translate it into a form that's going to be able to inspire and invoke action. And what we need to do is I think communicate perhaps what we do in slightly different ways. And finally, in this area, an opportunity where there's, a, I think, a huge gap is the quantification of, of, uh, of these interventions, showing the economic rate or the rate of return on interventions, something that policymakers are in need of and something that we might be able to, we can contribute to. We're almost at the end of the opportunities. Um, in the area of, of uh, uh, education, one of the challenges that we have found is that the lack of involvement and integration of environmental health, public, environmental health, one health, um, uh, planetary health um, ed, uh, information in training in both biomedical and non-biomedical areas. We're trying to do that. And so, but one of the challenges is a lot of the folks in the non-biomedical areas don't see what they're doing as being in this space. And maybe throughout the course of the next two days, we can put our heads together to find out ways in which we can attract our colleagues in finance, in engineering, and at social sciences to be able to help us in the challenges that we're faced with. So just close to finally, when I mentioned, was mentioning about public health institutions and weakness, sometimes we tend to focus, of course, on the top of this pyramid. And apologies to the late Dr. Verkow. We took his triangle of needs and made this the political challenges, political needs that we need. Um, but if we're going to achieve the, social, the, the sustainable development goals, we sometimes focus on, we focus on that, and sometimes we focus on the ministries of health. We do less on public works, education, and the environment. But we know that if regardless of what we're trying to do, if we're, if we're trying to be able to address and, uh, and achieve the sustainable development goals, we need effective public institutions. You need an effective justice system that can actually apply, have good laws and apply those laws fairly and equitably. We need a strong finance system that's going to be able to fund this. The WHO did a very interesting study last year and, and looked at, the, um, at, at health financing. And it came to the conclusion that 86% 
of healthcare financing can come from domestic sources. One other interesting stat. Does anybody know what the estimated cost per year to achieve the SDGs? It's about $1.5 trillion a year. Do you know what the losses are in corruption every year? Between $1.5 and $3 trillion a year. What we spend for official development assistance is about $150 billion a year. So this argument that we fight about internationally about achieving 0.7% of GDP as a target for aid, it's not about aid. It's about the bottom of this pyramid. If countries and, and societies can have sound, effective public institutions, effective finance ministries, oversight mechanisms for elections, justice departments, a free and open media, the checks and balances and abilities for the elected and the, to be able to implement what they do based on what the public has asked them to do will be sound. Rip this apart, fracture this or weaken it, and you have the recipe for insecurity and an inability of any country, any country, to be able to achieve the public needs of their citizens. And that's a recipe for insecurity. So that's the advocacy implementation. Don't forget we need to communicate to both the public as well as to uh, policymakers. And at CUGH, uh, these are some of the things, I'm not going to focus too much, uh, I'll share this with anybody, but know that we work uh, very carefully with and closely with many of you here in the audience, including Dr. Balbus, who's been a fantastic uh, guide for us, and Dr. Birnbaum has spoken at our conference in the past. Uh, our conference is coming up in Chicago, uh, where we will have a whole half-day satellite session bringing groups together to deal with environmental challenges that Dr. Pat's from the University of Wisconsin and Dr. Balbus are helping to lead. Um, we also have tools for communicating. So for those of you who are on social media, please share what you hear today. But we also try to do this through visual means, and we're, we're encouraging scientists and researchers to tell their stories through visual means, send them to us so we can share them worldwide. So there's a pictorial representation of what you do. We're also crowdsourcing research questions research questions from governments, NGOs, the private sector, and others in an attempt to connect our scientists up with research that is relevant to the communities, organizations that they want. We're trying to bridge that gap, which is a great opportunity and a huge need. Ironically, this Friday, our research committee is going to be having a webinar on climate change, information, and health risks. It's at noon. Did I say noon? So you can... Get that this Friday and register at cugh.org. And this is our conference taking place on translation and implementation for impact in global health. Uh, in 2020, we're coming back to DC. 21 is in Houston and 22 is in Los Angeles. We have to plan out way in advance. Uh, so you can register at cugh2019.org and we encourage you to please come. Please attend our satellite session and also our plenary session that we're having on planetary health, one health, and environmental health. I'll leave this up. These are just so many sources and people we work with from the EcoHealth Alliance in New York to the World Bank's One Health Operational Framework, which is really an outstanding document, by the way, for those of us who are working, for all of us working in this space. Take a look at that framework. It can be a very useful tool in the work that we're doing. Um, the American Association of Vet Medical Colleges, vets, veterinarians are way ahead of us, uh, uh, I think, for those of us who are not vets. And I want to thank Andy McCabe and the team there for their great work. And all of our members that we have, uh, the Lancet Commission, a whole series of universities uh, there and more, uh, the zoos, uh, Dr. Deem at St. Louis Zoo and others doing fantastic work in the One Health space, um, and National Geographic and the Pulitzer Center. Uh, who help us out to advance the communication tools of what we're doing. So I'd like to just uh, thank you very much for uh, listening. Uh, just know that we at CUGH uh, look forward to your guidance and collaboration as we work together to deal with the challenges that we and our planet are facing. As I said in the beginning, our planet is crying 911. Let's plant some trees, as Dr. Newman said. Let's work together. Collaboration on that last uh, SDG so we can actually live on a sustainable planet, a healthy planet.
for us all. Thank you very much.